All right, well, let's get started. Welcome back, everyone. It's great to see you all again. I hope you uh, had a well-deserved and enjoyable week off um, and weren't too kind of weighed down by the thought of assignments and exams and all that kind of stuff coming up. Today, we are moving on to T-tests. Now, everything we've done up until today has been important. All right, we've, we've, we've built a foundation, um, you know, we've learned some basic kind of statistical methods and, uh, and terms and approaches, but today with t-tests, t-tests are a really, a really foundational part of inferential statistics, all right? Today you're going to learn about the first really, I guess, ongoing useful thing you're going to learn about in this course, all right? I use t-tests all the time. You know, most of the papers I read, or a lot of the papers out there, use t-tests to, you know, examine data and report effects. All right, so this is this is real, you know, proper statistics that you can, you know, potentially take forward if you're going to be a researcher, or at least, you know, understand if you're going to be a consumer of research going forward. All right, so t-tests. This is the way you really want to start. You know, well, not start. Hopefully, you've been kind of getting it as we go. Um, but but this is really this is this is something you'll take forward. All right. And today we're going to look at simple, sim single sample t-tests and dependent means t-tests, uh, and that'll make sense as we go on. And then next week we're going to look at, um, at independent samples t-tests. All right, so the next two lectures are on t-tests, and, uh, and then after that we've really just got a kind of a course wrap-up. So it's just this week and next week, uh, and then we're done. So these are the formula we're going to be looking at today. All right, now these are no different, really, to the formula we've been looking at, you know, in a lot of the other lectures. All right, this is a t-score. It's just like a z-score. You know, these are these are estimated um, uh, standard deviations of, of sampling distributions. All right, you've you've seen that sort of thing before. Okay, this is a variance. It's a little bit different because of this, and 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 that's a really important difference that we'll get into. All right, so these are new formula, but they're not massively different or, or different at all to the form at format of the formula you've seen before. All right, so we're, we're often just taking the same kind of thing and using it in different situations. We, call, we give it a different symbol, you know, to distinguish it, and we call it something different sometimes, but often we're just, we're just taking a mean of different kind of groups or a standard deviation of different sort of groups. All right, and they're useful for different things, and we use them for different things. So we're going to have a quick recap. Then we're going to look at t-tests. We're going to look at this idea of estimating population variance or standard deviation. Uh, then we're going to look at the sa single sample and then the dependent means. So to remind you all, because you've been away for a week, so you've probably forgotten everything, um, we'll just have a little bit of a look at what, you know, what kind of got us to here. All right? So for any collection of data, we can examine how that data is distributed. All right, it doesn't matter what that data is, whether it's test scores or IQ scores or heights or reaction times in an experiment. Often we've got a collection of data and we want to see how it's distributed, all right? because there's, there's nearly always in the situations we're interested in, you know, the, the data has different values, all right? and it's how that data is distributed that's interesting. And we can determine a couple of things. We can look at the shape of that distribution. All right? So what does the shape of the distribution itself look like? Is it normal? Is it sort of pulled up to the right and positively skewed? Is it pulled down to the left and negatively skewed? All right, the shape tells us something about the thing we're interested in, the shape of the distribution, how that data is distributed. We're interested often in the central tendency. All right, and we saw that you can, we can take the mean, the median, and the mode, uh, but typically, you know, for analysis um, and, and, and for real sort of, you know, quantitative, you know, number crunching, we're going to be interested in the mean. All right, so we can see the shape of the distribution, and we can get the central tendency by looking at the mean. And then finally, what we're interested in is the variability within that distribution. All right, is there a really wide distribution? Are there, are there just you know, scores all over the place, or is it fairly narrow? All right, so not just where the central tendency is, but how is stuff distributed, you know, how widely around that? Okay, because that tells us something really important too. And we saw that we, uh, we can get this idea of variance, um, but, but if we take the square root of that, we get something that's a little bit more intuitive and we, uh, we often use the standard deviation. So these are the kinds of things we're interested in about data. All right, so we can have a population distribution. All right, so an entire population. Now remember, populations and samples all depends on you know, what we're looking at and the question we're asking. All right, so we can have a, a, a population distribution, and it has a mean that we, we signify by, uh, by mu, and a, and a standard deviation we signify by sigma here. These are the population parameters. All right, so this is a nice normal distribution with a mean and a standard deviation. We can take a sample 
from that population. All right, so we just take, we've got a whole population, we just want to take a small sample of that um, and see what that looks like, uh, and we can measure a mean and a standard deviation for our sample. All right, we use these, um, you know, regular kind of letters to, to, to indicate those, but it'll have a mean, a central tendency, and some kind of width. We can take lots of different samples from that population, and we can get the mean of each of those samples and see how those means are distributed. All right, we saw that that's a really useful and important thing when we want to compare our samples. We want to see, is our a sample of interest you know, weird compared to what we would expect for lots of samples like that? And again, we just have a different distribution here. It'll have a central tendency that we can calculate, and it'll have some width that we can determine. All right, so each of these are just distributions that have means and standard deviations. But that's not all. We could, we could also, you know, if we had lots and lots of samples, we could see how the standard deviations of those samples were distributed. Right? Now, we didn't do that, and you wouldn't typically do that, but it's just the same kind of thing. So we could look at how the variability of each of our small samples you know, varies. And we would have, again, some kind of mean and some, sign of, some kind of standard deviation for that distribution. And we have some standard formula for cal calculating these things. All right, so if we've got a population, we want to find our parameters. To find the mean, we just sum up all the elements and divide by n. To find the standard deviation, we do this. To find the z-score for a particular score, we just take the score we're interested in, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. All right, so we can find, we can calculate, if we have all the data for our population, we can just calculate those population parameters easily. We can do the same for our sample. And again, these are the exact same format for these formulae, they're just we're using them in different situations. So again, for the mean here, we just add up all the ones we've got, divide by the number. Standard deviation, we do that. That's good, we do that. And for our distribution of sample means, we can do the same thing again. So we can get, by adding up all the means for all the samples and divide it by n, similarly we can get our, um, our um, standard error of the mean. And if we're interested in a particular sample, the mean of that, we can see, in terms of z-scores, where it lies in the distribution of means and therefore determine if it's weird or not. So again, all the same kind of formula to look at the same kind of things, just in different distributions. All right. So you just got to remember, you know, just thinking about which one applies um, to the situation you're talking about. And we found, you know, conveniently, if we're interested in these um, sample means, we can uh, we can determine these parameters without actually having to take all those samples and work those out. If we know the population parameters, we can actually just plug them in and work these 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 um, these values out. All right, we found that was a use, really useful thing for doing our z-tests. So if we had a particular sample, we could find this sort of stuff and work out if our sample was weird or not, without having to take lots and lots and lots of samples and work that stuff out. And this is how we did that. So if we had our population, and if we, if we did a bunch of random sampling, which we don't necessarily have to do, we would get some sort of distribution of means like that, and we decided that there were these cutoffs here, where if our sample fell within this 95%, um, we would say that, well, that's, you know, pretty reasonable. We would expect that it's likely it came from this population. If the sample we were interested in actually fell out here, we would say, well, it's a bit weird. You know, we don't know for sure, but it's a bit weird compared to, you know, most of these. So we're going to infer that it comes from here. All right? If the sample we're interested in had a mean that was down here, we would say, well, that possibly, probably comes from some different population. All right, so this is what we were doing with Z scores, with uh, Z tests. So we want to find out, we're interested in a sample, how does our sample look compared to a whole bunch of random samples from some population that we know something about, usually the null hypothesis. And the way we did this hypothesis testing, okay, so in choosing between, we always, we assume the null is true. Right, that's what we're always working off, the null, hy the null hypothesis is there's nothing going on here. There's nothing weird, there's nothing happening, our sample is just from whatever null population we would expect. Right, that's always our starting assumption, and then that's the thing we're testing. So, we statistically test the probability of getting our sample if the null was true. All right, just conceptually that's what we're doing. We've got a sample and we say, well, would this sample be weird if our null was true or not weird? If the probability is high um, that our sample comes from here, if this was true, then we retain the null and we say any difference. So our sample is always going to be a bit different 
from the whole population because it's just a sample out of the population. All right? The question is, is it so different that it's weird? All right? So we said, well, no, under here, it's within that 95%. It's a little bit different, but um, the difference is just due to random variability, chance, whatever you want to call it. Alternatively, if the probability was low, so we're out in those tails, all right, well, we reject the null and we say, well, there is a difference, but it's big enough that it's weird. So it's actually a genuine difference. It's not just variability, you know, sampling variability. So that just means under the null here, we'd cut, fall in the 95%, retain the null. Otherwise, we fall in those tails and we reject the null. So... That all came down to these Z tests. So we're testing a sample of interest against the population, and the population is basically the population of the null hypothesis. Right? So we're testing our sample against the population of the null to see if it's weird or not. Um, but the key, key, key things to do this, we have to know these population parameters. All right, Because we can't usually just take lots and lots and lots of samples to work out that sampling distribution. All right? We need to know these to then work those out to work out if our sample is weird. All right? And that's the critical part here. To do a Z test, we have to know both of these things about our population. All right, and that's where we're up to. So, introduction to t-tests. What we're going to talk about today uh, and next week are all about t-tests. And as I said, these are, the, these are foundational kind of ideas in terms of inferential statistics. And, uh, and like many uh, of the best things in life, the story all starts with beer. The Guinness Beer Company, the Guinness Brewery, in the late 1800s, became massive fast. All right? And this is in the late 1800s. They were selling like millions and millions of litres a year. And they very smartly realised that if we're going to be a really big company selling lots of this stuff, our brand name is really important. And the one thing we absolutely have to make sure is that every single pint of Guinness tastes exactly like a pint of Guinness. All right? So they had to make sure they had quality control and their beer didn't vary. Now, the thing with beer is you're putting a lot of ingredients into it that vary widely. You know, you're getting hops from all over the country. They're getting, you know, they're making millions of litres of this stuff, so they're getting hops from everywhere. They're getting barley from everywhere. They're doing their process a little bit different every time. So how are they going to make sure that they're getting this consistency in their product when there's potentially a lot of variability in the ingredients? Well, they did a really, really smart thing for back then, and they decided they'd employ some scientists to come and help them with this. And they employed this guy, William Gossett, who was a chemist ostensibly, but also effectively a statistician. Now, there weren't statisticians back then. Even 120, 130 years ago, statistics barely existed. You know, so he didn't even realise he was a statistician, and no one else did. But he realised and started working out all of these things that we're going to use today. If you want to know what your hops are like, you can't test all your hops. You have to test a sample of your hops and test them against some kind of you know, population parameters that you're interested in. You, know, you can only test small samples of your things. You can test them regularly, but you've got to understand, if I'm testing a small sample, what does that tell me about the variability of all of my stuff? Okay? If I get a sample out that's a little bit weird, is it so weird that all of this stuff is, is, is weird or different, or is it just weird within, you know, random variability and my hops are actually okay and I can go on and make my Guinness. All right? So this idea of quality control became the foundation for all this sort of inferential statistics that we use today in science. You know? And these guys came up with it. Um, now, unfortunately for Paul William Gossett, you know, I mean, this is such a fundamental thing, we should know this as Gossett's t-test, but it's not. It's called the student's t-test. And the problem uh, that Guinness had was that they're a company trying to make money. He was basically a scientist who wanted to get his ideas out there, and they would only let him publish his results if he didn't talk about quality control, didn't talk about beer, and didn't use his own name. So he published under the pseudonym Student. So this has forever now been known as the Student's T-Test because he had to um, publish under that name. And so, so now not very pe many people know that it's actually Gossett that we have to thank for all of this stuff, unless you go to the Guinness factory uh, and they've got a, uh, a plaque up on the wall. Now, those of you who have Ash Harold uh, as your tutor, uh, she got this factory because she's a big stats nerd. And I uh, got this picture because she was at the factory and thought that was cool. So the student's t-test is a chemist and statistician. Um, this is where all this came from. You know? And it's not just the basis of science and the stuff we do. It's the basis of all kinds of industrial processes, quality control, manufacturing, all sorts of things like that. All right. So to do a z-test, we've got to know the population parameters. 
Right? We have to know mu and sigma in order to do a Z test. Okay? But often we don't know that. You know, if I'm looking at your quiz scores and, and this class is the population, well, I can work out mu and sigma very easily. But often the population is, you know, all people. You know, not just, and all people who ever lived. You know, so, so often it's impossible um, to, to actually, you know, empirically work these out. You know, we would literally have to take infinity samples in order to work these out. Okay? But sometimes, and in, in, in a lot of situations, we can work it so that... We don't know the population standard deviation, that's the hard thing to know, but we often do know the population mean. All right, so we often have a situation where we know the population mean mu, but we don't know the standard deviation. And the reason we know that the, the mean is because sometimes in certain situations we can set it to a particular value. All right, so we say we've got a sample and we want to test it against this mean. So we set the mu, or often, it turns out that the mu, we can set it up so that the mu is zero. All right, so often we know the mu, but we don't know the standard deviation. And that's when we use t-tests. All right, so t-tests are when we just don't know as much about the underlying population. And we have to know the mean, but what we end up doing is estimating the standard deviation. Okay, so for a z-test, we know both of these. For a t-test, we have to estimate the standard deviation. And that's one of the fundamental things that makes it different. Three types of t-tests. So I said we're doing two today and, uh, and one next week. We've got a single sample, a dependent means, and an independent means. These come back to um, you know, our underlying data and, uh, and in the case of uh, these, um, the uh, experimental paradigm, the experimental approach that we use. All right? So for the single sample, we just have a single sample group. All right? So we've got some single sample of data that we're testing against some specific value. All right, now I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail, so just try and you know, keep up as I'm doing it. But this is about just one sample of data that we're testing against some specific value. Dependent means we have two samples of data, all right, and we're testing them effectively against each other. And this is the case when we have um, what we call a, you know, repeated measures or within subjects design. So if you remember back to the early lectures on experiments, when we get a group of people and we get the same people to do both conditions of the experiment, okay? And then we get their two results and it's a dependent means, okay? So those means depend on each other because the same people did both things. And the independent means is then when we have an independent group or so between subjects, all right? So if we do an experiment and we've got one group does this condition, a totally separate group does this condition, and we want to compare those two samples, all right, so depending on whether we've got one single sample of data, two samples, but the same people did both things, or two samples and different people did the two conditions. That's what drives which t-test we use. So, for example, a single sample t-test. All right, so a single sample group, we're testing against some specific value. Imagine I've got a coin, and I want to test that it's fair. All right, so I want to test my coin that it's fair, so I want to flip it 200 times. So I flip my coin 200 times. That's my single sample of data. And just arbitrarily, I say, you know, tails are zeros, heads are one. Um, I flip it 200 times, and I get a mean of 0.58. Right, so 58% of the time it came up heads, 42% of the time it came up tails. I've got a single sample of data. If I wanted to do a Z test, um, I'd have to compare this sample with all samples of 200 to see if it's weird or not. To do that, I need these, all right? Now, I can't find them out, all right? I, I'd need to flip a coin infinity times to get the population parameters. In order to actually work out mu and sigma, I'd have to flip a coin that many times. Now, obviously, I can't do that. But what I do know is the mean, because I know that for a fair coin, it should come out at 50%. All right, so just because of the way this sort of problem is set up, I just know the population mean, but I have no idea what the standard deviation is. So, we flip a coin, um, it should come up with a mu of 0.5, we have to estimate the standard deviation. So this would be an example of a situation where we would use a single sample t-test. got one sample of data, and I'm testing it against some mean that I've effectively set. All right, I've set the mean at that because that's just what a fair coin is. Dependent means, two samples, but the same subjects participate in each condition of the study. 
All right, so we had a look at this um, experiment, can you tickle yourself? So with the robot arm and you, you know, using, uh, using the robot, the experimenter does it. Um, what we did, you know, we, we looked at it in terms of a Z test, right? So we would have to get a group of people to tickle themselves um, and say, rate it, all right? And then we would compare that with the population of people who had not tickled themselves and how ticklish they saw, thought something was. Well, clearly that's impossible to do. How do we get the population of everyone to be tickled by someone else and rate that ticklishness? Okay, so we can't compare our sample to the population. We don't know what the mean would be. We don't know what the standard deviation would be. All right, so we can't do a single sample t-test. So what we do instead is a repeated measures experiment. We get a group of people and we get them to first tickle themselves and then rate, and rate how ticklish it is. Then we get them to be tickled by the robot and rate that. All right, now we counterbalance it. We swap that order around for half the people so we don't get any you know, order effects. But then, so we've got two samples of data. All right, so for our same group of people, we've got their ticklish rating when they tickle themselves and their ticklish rating when they were tickled by someone else. So the question is, can you tickle yourself? Well, again, we don't know anything about the population, but what we would expect if we think about the null hypothesis, all right, so if the null hypothesis would be there's no difference. The null is always about there's nothing weird here. Okay, so under the null, those two groups should be um, effectively the same. So that means for a particular person, their rating for being tickled by themselves or the robot should be no different. All right? Because if under the null, we're saying there's no difference. But we wouldn't expect for each person that that, that would work out like that. All right? Because we just get random variability. But we would expect that on average, there would be no difference. Okay? So what we can do in this case is effectively turn two samples into a single sample where we know the mean. Okay, so if we get, instead of having uh, the two samples of this is the, the rating when you tickled yourself, this is the rating when the, when the experimenter tickled you, we subtract them and get a difference rating. Okay, so now we just have a single sample of differences and we know the mean of that because under the null hypothesis, that should be zero. So now we've just changed that into one of these and we can work it out the same way. So... Um, we know under the null that would be zero, so we then just need to estimate the sigma again. All right, so t-tests are all going to be about estimating the population variance or standard deviation in order to kind of then work out, you know, where does our sample sit. Independent means. So two samples here, but different people. Um, so an example of this, does being an alcoholic affect your reaction time? Um, we'd need to know all of this, but this is next week, so I'm not going to worry about that now. It all comes down to this, estimating the population variance. All right. Now, I'm going to explain all of this conceptually, um, but ultimately, you know, you don't really need to understand this if you don't want to. I mean, I, I feel that you will do much better at maths and you will do much better at this if you get it conceptually and know what we're doing and why. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you just want to remember to use a formula, you can just remember to use a formula. But that's a recipe for disaster. So I'm going to go through it, but don't freak out too much if some of it might not make as much sense as you know, some of the other stuff has. All right, so this was your mid-semester quiz scores. All right, so right, right back when we started looking at data distributions, I put this up. Um, they had uh, the population, okay? So we've got a restricted population, so I could actually work these out, all right? And I found that there was a, there was a mean of, of 82% and a standard deviation of 9%. And one of the exercises we looked at, I said, if you've got some, a group of mature age students, 30 people had a mean of 84, uh, and we wanted to know, was, you know did, did mature age students do better than, uh, than everyone else, or was that just you know, different because of random variation? All right? So it's different to 84, but did they outperform the group? Um, well, we would have to know, what does any random group of 30 look like? and then compare our group of interest, you know, to any group, random group of 30. So, what would any random group of 30 look like? I can just get a random group of 30 scores here and work out the mean. Then I get another random group of 30 scores and work out the mean. Then I get another random group of 30 scores and I work out the mean. And if I do that a thousand times, um, what I end up getting then is a distribution of means. Okay, so I've taken 1,000 samples of 30, I've grabbed each of these means and looked at the distribution, all right? So the question then becomes, is our 84% weird compared to this distribution here? 
All right. But what I find when I do that is that each of these means is different to the population mean. Okay? This one's 81, population's 82. That's 83. You know, each of these sample means will be different, all right? But it's unbiased. So what that means is for everyone that kind of falls on this side, there's one on this side. And if I average these out, they'll come out to the population mean. So that's what we mean by saying that the sample mean is an unbiased estimate of the population mean. Right? Any particular sample mean will be different usually to the population mean, but it's, a, it's the best estimate we have and it's unbiased, okay? because it's just as likely to be below the population mean as it is above, and which if we did it heaps and heaps and heaps of times, it would average out to the population mean. Okay, so we can use this sample mean to estimate that. It's an unbiased estimator. Now, I can also look at the variability of each of these samples. All right, so instead of taking the mean of each one and getting the distribution of that, I could take the standard deviation of each of these and see what that looks like. So my standard deviation of that one happens to be that, and that one happens to be that, and that one happens to be that. If I take a 1,000 samples and get the standard deviation of each of those, I can see how that's distributed. And we get another sort of distribution, all right? Each one of these is going to be, you know, different to each other because of, of, of sampling variability, all right? And we get a distribution here. But what I find this time is, if I average it all out, it comes out a little bit less than the population. That's what we mean by saying that the standard deviation is a biased estimator of the population standard deviation. So each one of these is going to be different, but typically it's going to be different on the low side than the high side. All right, so I can't just use this straight standard deviation to estimate this because it's biased. It's going to come out more often low than high. So whereas the mean is unbiased, the standard deviation is biased. So that's the sample for the population. So that's the problem we've got to deal with here. You know, that's kind of the, the, the crux of the problem. So sample means are an unbiased estimator of the population mean. Sample standard deviations, and so variance, are biased estimates, um, and they always underestimate, you know, on average, the population parameters. Standard deviation and variance. So, for the population, we have the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation. We can work these out if we have all the data. Okay? Our sample equations look very similar. But what we can do is use our sample data to estimate our population parameters. All right? So we just want to use the information we have, which is the sample, to have some sort of estimate of the information we don't have, which is the population. And the way we do that is, typically, just our, our mean here is the best estimate of our population mean, all right? But when it comes to the variance and the standard deviation, we have to do something a little bit different. And that's where we get this n minus 1, all right? So if we're just calculating the variance of the sample, we do this. But if we want to use the sample, to estimate the variance of the population, we have to do this. Now, these are all the same things. These are the same X's and M's, all right, and N's. They're the same things, okay, but we just have to divide it a little bit differently. Now, you think about that. What that means is, you know, whatever number that turns out to be, if we're dividing it by a smaller number, it'll, that'll be bigger, all right? So S squared will always be a little bit bigger than SD squared. So our estimate of the population variance will be a little bit bigger than the sample variance. Okay? And that's how we account for this you know, biased um, you know, um, property. And similarly, the standard deviation. Now again, note, these equations all look very similar in, in, in you know, how they're kind of um, you know, structured. Uh, but notice here, okay? So when we're talking about the population parameters, we're using sigmas. When we're talking about the sample, we're using SDs. When we're talking about using the sample to estimate the population, we use an S. All right, so when we're using an S, we've got an N minus 1 under here. So this is using our sample to estimate the population. 
Now, that's just the sum of the squares. All right, so we, the squared deviation, you know, it's shorthand, we call that the sum of the squares. This we call the degrees of freedom. And I'm going to, I'll explain that. And again, look, you don't strictly need to get it, but if you get it, it's good. All right? So this is the sum of the squares. That's the degrees of freedom. So you'll often see in shorthand here. So our estimate of the population variance is the sum of the squares divided by the degrees of freedom. And our estimate of the population standard deviation is therefore just the square root of that. So this is what we're going to use to estimate the thing we don't know. So, let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Let's imagine a population here, super small population, 1, 2 and 3. Okay, so n equals 3, the population mean is just 2, and the population variance is 0.667. All right, I've got a very small, manageable population. I can work these things out directly. Now imagine I did some sampling of that population. So where there's, there's three things in the population, I'm just going to do samples of two of those. All right? Well, these are all the possible samples of n equals 2. All right? And when we're sampling, we're always assuming we put things back so you can get the same sample twice. This is the same element twice. So if I take samples of two out of this population, I could get these you know, however, eight things there. That's all I can get. I can then take the mean of each of my samples. All right, so I want to work out the sample mean because that's just you know something we do when we've, when we've got samples. That's what we're trying to figure out. So each of my samples, and you can see here, you get differences. Each sample has a different mean. All right, there's sampling variability, random variability of the samples, and each mean is different to the population mean typically, but it's unbiased. Okay, there's as much below as there is above. Now, what I can work out here is I can work out the deviation of each of my samples from the sample mean, okay, and I can work out the deviation of each of my samples from the population mean. All right, so how different are each of the members of my sample from the sample mean, and how different are they from the population mean? All right, this is where this whole biased estimating comes down to. All right, you can see here that there is less variability here than there is here. All right, each of these elements is further away from the population mean than they are from the sample mean. Okay, these numbers are just bigger. So when you compare a sample to the population mean, you get a lot of variability. When you compare a sample just to its own sample mean, you get less variability. All right? Now this here is going to be an indicator of you know, the variability of the samples, the standard deviation. And this is why the sample standard deviation underestimates the population standard deviation. Okay? Because a sample is going to be less different from the sample mean than that sample is going to be to the population mean. Okay, because there's more stuff in the population mean. So, the sample scores are closer to the sample mean than they are to the population mean. This makes sense since the sample mean is derived from the sample scores, whereas the population mean includes a bunch of other scores. So this has less variability than this. So, if we work out just our sample variance, okay, using just our x minus m over n, so this is our sample variance, this is using our sample to estimate the population variance. Each of these is different to the sample, the population variance, okay, it's just one sample, they're going to be, each one's going to be different, but if we average them out, what we find is on average, they underestimate. So the sample variances underestimate the population variance. But if we do the same thing with these ones, where we've used our n minus 1 instead of n, what we find is that it comes out perfectly. So this is why we have an n minus 1 in here instead of an n, because this underestimates this. All right, And it turns out that just changing this to the degrees of freedom n minus 1, we end up being able to accurately give an unbiased estimate of the population variance.
just quickly on degrees of freedom. So what the hell does that even mean? Well, imagine I asked you to pick three numbers and I said you can pick any three numbers, all right? Well, the first number could be anything. You can pick any number you want. The second number could be anything. The third number could be anything. If I just say pick three numbers, pick any three numbers, each of those three numbers is free to vary. Each one can be anything you want. So there's three degrees of freedom. All right? Each of those, it says, how many things are free to vary? If I say pick three numbers with no restrictions, there's three degrees of freedom. But if I start introducing some um, restrictions, then I can potentially reduce how, many, how much variability you have. So if I say instead, pick three numbers, but they have to add up to 125, well, your first number can still be anything. That's free to vary. Your second number can still be anything. That's free to vary. But once you pick that first and second number, your third number's fixed. It can't be anything anymore. All right? So there's only two degrees of freedom. As soon as we put a restriction like this in, we reduce that variability, how many things are free to vary. That's all degrees of freedom mean. Another way we can do it, say we have four numbers and we know their mean is five. All right? So that's the restriction. We put some restriction on our four numbers. Okay, well, the first one could be anything, you know, say it's 15. Second one could be anything, say it's 3. Third one could be anything, say it's 37. But once we've picked these three, they were free to vary, but once we've picked them, then the fourth one is locked in. There's only one number that can be. In order that, their mean is 5, all right? And it has to be negative 35. So we've got four numbers here, but there's only three degrees of freedom. Um, now again... This is a conceptual thing that if you kind of get it, that would be probably good for you, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. So, what are we actually doing here and why are these degrees of freedom? Well, what we're doing is we're adding up all the deviations squared and we want to divide it by the number of deviations that are free to vary. All right, so we're saying we're going to get all the deviations, so we've got all these different x's, we're going to get all those deviations squared. Well, how many of them are actually free to vary? Well, not all of them, because there's a restriction. And if you remember that our definition of the mean is... So once we've... So say we've got four of these. Once we've picked three of them, the fourth one's fixed because the sum of the deviations always has to be zero. All right? So that's what this idea that n minus 1 is the degrees of freedom here. And we use degrees of freedom um, to, uh, to estimate the population variance. So, single sample t-tests, how do we actually use all of this? All right, so the t-test comes down to estimating the population variance, um, and, uh, and we, use, uh, we use degrees of freedom for that. So, z-test, we have to know the population parameters. t-test, we have to know the population mean, okay? That's a must. We've got to know the population mean, one way or another, and we've got to estimate the population standard deviation. So, how do we do that? Face vase illusion. Do you see a face or do you see a vase? Who sees a face? Hands up. Who sees a vase? Hands up. Well, what most people typically see is a mix of both. You sort of see one, then it flips to the other, then it flips to the other. All right? So people typically see... You typically only see one thing at a time, all right? But you generally get a little bit of flipping, all right? That's the, all that's called the Rubin vase, the face vase, vase illusion. Now, I have a hypothesis, and I reckon faces are really important to people more so than other objects, you know, in particularly vases. All right, so my hypothesis is that faces are important to people. So I reckon that when people look at this, I reckon they're going to be biased to see faces over vases. Okay? This is my, you know, idea about human perception, uh, and it's something I want to test, and I'm going to use this face-vase illusion to test that. All right, so faces are important. I think people are going to be biased to see faces when they see this. All right, so how am I going to test that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a sample of 20 people. All right? So that's my sample. I get 20 people, and I sit them down in front of a computer monitor, and I flash that image at them, say, 25 times. And each time I flash it, I say, what did you see, a face or a vase? And you, you know, respond using a keyboard. Okay? And I just I say, look, you don't have to overthink it. It's just, what was your dominant percept? You know, did each one feel more sort of facey or more vasey? Um, I do that 25 times, uh, and then what I do is for each of these 20 people, I get um, some sort of percentage then. I work out what percentage, you know, were face re re responses. Okay, so I've got a sample of 20, 
flash, flash this at them, um, what, what percentage of face reports do I get for each person? Null hypothesis. All right, my null hypothesis is always just there's nothing going on here. So my null hypothesis is that, you know, there is no bias. There's just nothing here. Um, what we would expect is just a 50-50 split. Okay, so you can see here, this is how I get to know the population mean without having to do a whole bunch of experiments. Okay, under the null hypothesis, the mean should just be 50%. So that's what I'm going to test my sample against. Okay, I still don't know the population variance. Like if I got infinity people to come in, under the null hypothesis, I'd expect to get 50% faces, you know, there's no bias, but I don't know what the distribution would look like. All right, so that's the thing I have to estimate. Under the, uh, the alternate hypothesis, face reports are going to be different to 50%. All right? So the null is always specific. The alternate is just basically not the null. So what do I do? Well, these are my 20 people. This is how many faces each one responded out of the 25. Um, this is it converted into a percentage. I take the mean of that, and what I get is 62%. So for my sample of 20 people, I get a, res a, a response rate of, of 62% faces. Okay. Well, that's different to 50%, but it's only 20 people. The question obviously is, of course, it always comes down to, is it different enough to be weird? All right. If we grab, even if under the null hypothesis, if we grab 20 people, you know, we might get an average of 62%. We're going to work out, is it different enough that it's weird? So, is it a meaning, is it a random variation, or is it a meaningful bias for a sample of 20? We've got one sample of data here. I've just got one group of people and their responses. One sample, I know the mean, population mean, just by definition, is 50%, because that's the thing I'm testing under the null hypothesis. Okay? I have no idea what the population standard deviation or variance is. All right? So this is a single sample t-test. That's how I know it's a single sample t-test. You've got you to look at data and you know, be able to work out what am I supposed to do here. Right, so there's three things I need to check off to know that what I'm doing. Single, one sample, I know the mean, I don't know the standard deviation. Single sample t-test. Now, when we're doing a z-test, all right, so this is what we did this a couple of weeks ago. If we're doing a z-test, this is kind of the process we go through. So we've got some sample here, all right? This is my sample. They've, there's some mean and some standard deviation for my sample. I've got some population under the null hypothesis. I know the mu, I know the sigma, okay? When I'm doing a z-test, I know this population, and I want to ask myself, is it likely that this sample comes from this population or not? And the way I do that is I get this distribution of sample means, you know, by, by working out my um, standard error from this, and, uh, and that's just that. So what I want to know is, is this weird compared to this distribution here? Um, and the way I do it is I work out the parameters from this. Um, I then work out using a z-score, where does my sample sit in here? So I get the score I've got minus this, so that works out where it is in units of standard deviation. And I know that for a 0.05 alpha, I've got cutoffs of 1.96. So all I have to do is work out the z-score for my sample and say, is it outside those 1.96 cutoffs? Now we're going to do a similar thing for our t-tests, okay? But there's going to be a little bit of an extra step because the first problem is we don't know sigma. All right, we don't know what sigma is, so we can't do this process. But we can work out an estimate for it. All right, so the first thing we then have to do is we have to use our sample to estimate the population parameter. Okay, so we can get our sample data and by using just an n minus 1 here, we can work out an s as an estimate of sigma. Now, we don't have sigma, so we don't have the standard error of the mean. But we can use s to work out an estimate of the standard deviation of this. It use it exactly the same way. Okay, so instead of getting sigma and dividing by the square root of the sample size, we get s and divide by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so you can see it's the exact same process, we're just going to do it a little bit differently. We can then, instead of working out a z-score, we work out a t-score, but it's exactly the same thing. Okay? Our z was just um, the mean minus the mu over the sigma, our t is just 
the mean of our sample minus whatever the population mean is, which we know, divided by our estimate of this standard deviation. So we do a T just like we do a Z. There's just some different you know, things plugged in there because of what we don't know. Then we compare the T score that we get to some cutoff. So we'll have T cutoffs here instead of Z cutoffs. And we say, is our T inside or outside those cutoffs? And in which case, if it's inside, we retain the null. If it's outside, we'd reject the null. So exact same process except for this extra step here where we have to estimate this first. We're just not given that. Um, but we've got another problem. The first problem is we don't know the sigma. The second problem is this isn't necessarily normal. Okay, It's close to normal, but how normal this is actually depends on the sample size. Now, we assumed it was normal when we were doing the Z testing. All right. Strictly speaking, you need a minimum sort of sample size for that to hold. And we have to take account of that when we're doing a t-test. So for small sample size, this distribution isn't normal. So what that means is these cutoffs change. So under a normal distribution, an alpha of 0.05, okay, that's where those cutoffs are. They're our, our, our Z cutoffs. Okay, so you've got 2.5% in this wing, 2.5% in this, 95% in the middle. Okay? For a nice normal distribution, that's, that's where the cutoffs are to get 2.5% in each wing. But if we've got small sample sizes, that sampling distribution looks a little bit weird. If our degrees of freedom are only two, so we've only got three in our sample size, we get this really kind of flat, spread out distribution that's not quite normal. It's got these big fat tails. And what that does is it pushes these cutoffs out. If our degrees of freedom are a little bit more, so we've got a slightly bigger sample, well, it starts becoming a little bit more normal, but it's still really flat. Now, as we get increased sample size, we pull these cutoffs in. You know, towards this 1.96. Degrees of freedom of 5, those cutoffs though are about 3. If we increase our degrees of freedom again, okay, so degrees of freedom of 10, that means a sample size of 11, well, it starts to look a little bit more normal, okay, and our cutoffs are in here. So what we did for the Zs was we effectively just had one curve. We assumed this normal curve and the cutoffs for Point out per two and a half percent here, two and a half percent. They were always one point nine six. But for t distributions, where well, there's actually a family of t distributions, all right, there's a whole bunch of these, a different one for different degrees of freedom or different sample sizes. Okay, so we're going to have a different cutoff depending on how big our sample is. So that's the key, the second key difference. Okay, so the first key difference between a T test and a Z test is we've got to estimate the population variance or standard deviation. The second key difference is even for the same you know alpha level of 0.05, whereas before we could always assume a cutoff of 1.96, well now we have different cutoffs depending on how big our sample size is. And if we look at the T tables, so there's Z tables to look these up, there's T tables as well. And what we see now is instead of um, well, if you remember the Z tables, you could kind of look up anything. But now we just have three different levels of significance. So typically we're going to be interested in this one, the 0.05. Okay? So if you know your degrees of freedom, you just look across and you find your degrees of freedom. So if I've got, um, you know, 30 samples, I've got a degrees of freedom of 29, I'm using an alpha of 0.05, um, that's my cutoff. And you can see that as the degrees of freedom increase, that 0.05 cutoff gets closer and closer until you, if your degrees of freedom are infinite, then it comes, you know, becomes normal and you've got a 1.96 cutoff. So to work out these cutoffs, you've got to know the alpha level, which we'll typically use as 0.05, but you've got to know your sample size and therefore your degrees of freedom. Okay? So then we find what the cutoff is and compare our T value to that cutoff. So back to our phase vars illusion. So for a sample size of 20, we've got a mean of 
I want to test it against this idea of that, you know, the null hypothesis is that it's unbiased, okay? So 50%. That's what I want to test it against. So the first thing I have to do is estimate the population standard deviation. All right, so I use this formula here. So this is just each of my samples minus the mean, 62%. I square them all, sum them all up, divide it by 20 minus 1, which is 19, do that. So this is my estimate of the population standard deviation. Then I can use that to estimate the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So this is just my S that I just worked out, so 0 0.172 over the square root of my sample size, 20, so that's 0 0.038. Then I can work out my T-score is the mean I've got, which is 62%, so 0 0.62 minus the population mean, 0 0.5, divided by this estimated standard error, and I get a T-score of 3.16. All right, now I've got to decide, is that weird or not? So I have to go to the T-tables and look up the appropriate cutoff point. So I've got a T of 3.16. My degrees of freedom, I've got a sample of 20, so my degrees of freedom are 19. For an alpha of 0.05, that's my critical cutoff there, 2.093. Okay, so my T is bigger than that, so it's different enough that it's weird, I reject the null hypothesis. And I say that people have a face bias based on this data. People saw significantly more faces than you would expect if it was completely unbiased or something like that. So we've got to estimate the sample, not the population variance or standard deviation, work out a T-score and then compare it to a particular cutoff for our sample size. So, the face report is significantly different to 50%. Another example. Average atmospheric CO2 in 1970 was 325 parts per million. Um, in 2000, I get um, 360 parts per million. My N is 25, and some of the squares is that. Okay, that's just so you don't have to work out all those individual bits. So I want to know, is my 2000 level significantly different from my 1970 level? Okay, I've got a mean there that I'm comparing it to, but I don't know the standard deviation or the variance. Okay, so I've got a single sample here of 25. Um, this is the mean of it. I've got the sum of the squares. First thing I do is estimate the population variance. So the population variance is just the sum of the squares over the degrees of freedom. This I've been given. Um, degrees of freedom is 24, which is that. Okay, so I've estimated the population variance. Then I estimate the um, standard deviation of the distribution of means. So I just plug those numbers in and I get 11. Then I have to work out the T-score for this. Okay, well the T is just the mean I've got, which is 360, divided by the population I'm interested in, which is 325, divided by, minus, sorry, divided by the standard deviation of that distribution, and I get a T-score of 3.18. But now I need to know, is that different, um, well is that different to my cutoff for this sample size? Alright, so I've got a sample size of 25, so I need to find out, you know, where I am here. Um, turns out that for degrees of freedom of 24, that's the cutoff. Um, the T-score I found is out there. So I conclude, yes, the 2000 levels are unusual compared to the 1970 figures. 2000 measurements are probably from a different population. The atmosphere has changed significantly since 1970. Another example. Just looking straight at the data, not even doing it in terms of a, a worded problem. I've got some sample with a mean of this, the 16 in it. I've got the sum of the squares of this. And I want to know, does, does this sample come from this population where I know the mean, but I don't know the variance? First thing I have to do is estimate population variance. All right, sum of the squares divided by the degrees of freedom. That's the sum of the squares. You know, if I gave you, I could have given you all just the individual data points and you made you, made you work out the mean. Um, and then square that and then sum them all up, all right? But instead, we've just given you the sum of the squares there and we'll do that sometimes. Um, so I work out here the uh, estimate of the population variance. 
Then I have to work out the estimate, the standard error, or the, the standard deviation of the distribution of means. And I just plug that in. That's just the square root of S squared over N, uh, which comes out at that. From there, I calculate my T-score. So the T-score is just the mean I've got, which is 475, minus the popula population mean I'm comparing to, divided by the standard error of the distribution of means. And I get a T of 3.25, but for N equals 16, or degrees of freedom of 15, I then have to go and look up the appropriate cutoff, and what I find is that for a um, degrees of freedom of 15, the cutoff is 2.131, and again, I fall outside of that, so I reject the null. So, that population, that sample did not come from this population. Uh, and again, I'll just show you here, you know, compared to the, uh, compared to the normal. So these T distributions are sort of flatter and wider, and then as you increase the degrees of freedom, they kind of squeeze in and become more like the, uh, more like the normal distribution, which pulls these cutoffs in. So, no, the sample did not come from this population. So that's how we do it for a single sample. Okay, we've got one sample of data, we've got some mean that we know, usually because we've, we've just set it for some reason or we've been given it. Um, you know, we've theoretically set it like flipping coins or, or you know, an unbiased sort of face um, uh, response. But again, we don't often get that. You know, typically in, in experiments, what we do is we have two groups you know, and, and, and we test sort of a, a, an experimental condition and a control condition, and we want to compare two samples with each other. Okay? We don't necessarily want to compare one sample to some you know, the hypothetical population that we don't know much about. We want to compare two samples to each other. That's often what we'll do. And that's where we need um, the dependent means, if we've done a repeated measures experiment, or the independent means, if we've done a, a, a between groups experiment. So, dependent means. We previously tested a single sample against some hypothetical set mean, but most of the time we don't know anything about the population. Okay? Most of the time we don't even know the mean of the, popu of the, of the population. So we have to do something tricky. What we do then is we test a sample under the alternative hypothesis, we call that the experimental condition, and we test the sample under the control condition. Okay? That's the null hypothesis. If that's the same sample of people doing both of those, then it's within groups and we use this Dependent means t-test. If they're two different groups, we'll worry about that next week. So what we need is a statistical test to compare two samples to see if they're meaningfully different. Okay? Before we were comparing a sample to see if it was different compared to the population, or effectively to see if it was different compared to you know, a whole bunch of samples of that size, but now we just want to compare two samples and decide if they're meaningfully different from each other. Uh, that's just I've said that. So, can you tickle yourself? We'll look at this example. So, under the Z test, we got I said we would get a group to tickle themselves and rate it, and then compare that to a population. You know, but we'd need to know the, the the population parameters there, and that's you know impossible to know. So we could never really do a Z test like that. So, what we do is we set up a um, a special kind of case of a single sample t test. Right? We can't actually do a normal single sample t-test because we still don't even know the population mu. Okay? But remember I said before, what we can do is this idea of different scores. We can set it up a little bit differently to kind of make it like a single sample t-test. So, a special tickling up robot arm was devised. Tickling was administered to participants' right hands. Okay, so we've got our independent variable is who's doing the tickling. Okay? That's our IV. It's got two levels. Either the robot arm is controlled by the participant, so you tickle yourself, or the robot arm is controlled by the experimenter. So the experimenter doesn't, you don't know what's happening. A dependent variable, okay, so we've got to operationalise this some, somehow. How do we actually, how do we measure, you know, ticklishness? Okay, well, one way to do that would be measure the time required for participants to pull their hand away. Okay, so it's more, more ticklish would be you'd pull your hand away quicker, you know, less ticklish you'd be able to leave your hand there longer. Okay, somehow we have to operationalise this. Um, and you know, that's, that's always a key part of designing an experiment, you know, how are we going to actually measure this thing that we're interested in. So, an IV with two conditions uh, and a DV that we measure here being, uh, being time. 
So repeated measures design. Okay, so we wanted to use the same people in both uh, for whatever reasons. Um, so you'd have to get them to either do tickle themselves first and then the experimenter does it, or you do it the other way around. So we counterbalanced it. So you know, if we had six participants, half would do it one way, half do it the other way, so we don't get any order effects. Under the null hypothesis, this is what we'd expect. Okay, we'd expect the populations to be the same. Okay, so there'd be some ticklishness rating measured by you know time to, to move your hand away um, for whether you're tickled by yourself or by the experimenter, and those populations would be the same under the null hypothesis, and under the alternate hypothesis, they're just different. They're just not the same. Now we might expect it to be this way. You'd be able to leave your hand there longer when you're tickling yourself. Okay, but we might not necessarily you know prescribe that up front. The only thing we can say for sure is the null is they're the same. So this is what we're trying to test. But we don't know any of the population parameters. We can't know any of the population parameters for these populations. So we have to do something a little bit different. So each participant being tickled by themselves in the experiment, they rate the ticklish for each. Under the null hypothesis, we might expect for each participant that there'd be no difference in those two ratings. Okay? Under the null, the null hypothesis is there's no difference between being tickled by yourself or the experimenter. So under the null, we'd expect for each participant that there would be no difference there. So the, the ticklishness rating or the time for their self minus the experimenter would be zero. But we're going to get variability. That's not going to happen for each person. Okay? So due to random variation, individual participants won't satisfy this, but under the null hypothesis, on average, we should get that. So on average, the different scores should come out to zero if the null hypothesis is true. So that's going to be the thing we want to test. And the way we do it is this. So what we've got, we want to determine um, if the different scores, we've got a single sample now instead of two. We know the population mean for this, because we've just said it needs to be zero. Um, and so what we do is work this out. So we'd have our six participants here. Okay, we'd have the time for each of them um, when they're tickled by the experimenter, the time for each of them when they're tickled by themselves, and then we just work out the difference there. Okay, so for each one, we get a different score. So this is now our single sample. Now, each of those is different to zero, as you'd expect, you know, under any situation, just because there's random variability. We can work out the means for each of these. What we find is that the mean for the different scores is 6.33. So the question we're now asking ourselves, is that meaningfully different to zero? All right, now under the null hypothesis, that should be zero. Now, even if the null hypothesis is true, you wouldn't expect it to be zero, but what we want to say is, is it different enough to, from zero that it's weird or not? Okay, so that's what we're testing here. Is this single sample here, with a mean of 6.33, is that so different from zero that it's weird? Does it come out in those tails? So, for the different scores now, we need to work out our deviations and our squared deviations. Okay, so this is just 8 minus 6.33, 1 minus 6.33, 9, because this is the sample now that we're working on. Okay? This is the population we're interested in. This is the population of, of the distribution of sampling means that we're interested in. It's all about different scores now. Once we work that out, we can work out the sum of the squares. Okay, so that's just sum of the squared deviations. So, the question for our statistical test, is our observed mean difference a likely random sample mean um, for n equals 6, from a population of different scores with a mean of 0. Okay, so it's different to 0, but is it so different that it's weird for a group of 6 people? So, we've turned a repeated measures test of two means into a single means t-test. And we know how to do that, because we've just done it three times. All we have to do is, first of all, we have to estimate the population variance. Now, this is for the different scores. Okay, so the population variance is just the sum of the squares over here divided by the degrees of freedom. So it's 130.33 divided by 5, which we get as 
So the first thing we do, we have to estimate the population variance. The next thing we do, we have to use that to estimate the, um, the variance or the standard deviation of our distribution of means. And that's just the population variance over n square rooted, and we get 2.08. And from there, we can then calculate a t-score. Okay, so the t-score here is just the mean we've observed, which is 6.33, minus the population mean, which is zero, because under the null hypothesis, there should be no difference, divided by our standard error here, estimated standard error. We get a t-score now for the differences of 3.04. So the question is, is that outside our cutoff for uh, degrees of freedom of five, or a sample size of six? So we go to our table for a 0.05 alpha, degrees of freedom of five, we see the cutoff is 2.571, uh, which looks something like that. So there's the cutoff at 2.571. Our observed T is outside of that. So we conclude that, no, our sample did not likely come from a population of different scores with zero. So our population of six is a bit weird if you were assuming that null hypothesis where there was no difference between being tickled by yourself and being tickled by the experimenter, and we conclude that you cannot tickle yourself. So we turned... Because we had the repeated measures and everyone did the same thing, we could work out each person's different score and turn those two samples just into one sample where we know that under the null, the difference between those should be zero. We could also measure an effect size for this. All right, so Cohen's D we looked at um, in the, uh, when we were doing Z tests. All right, so how big of an effect is that? Okay, so, so we got a mean, a mean difference score of 6.33 for our group. Is that a big effect? Is it a small effect? You know, how big an effect is it? Well, all we do is the exact same way we did it before, um, where we get our two population means, okay, and divide by our estimated standard deviation for the different scores. Now, what are our two population means? Well, population for mean for the different score is 6.33 whatever it was, um, under the null it's zero, and we work that out. So 6.33 minus zero over the estimated population standard deviation. We can work that out because we, worked it, we knew the sum of the squares and the degrees of freedom, so we worked that out as 5.01. Okay? So our Cohen's D, therefore, for whether or not you can tickle yourself, comes out at 1.24, which, remember, anything bigger than about 0.8 is a pretty big effect. You need to know how to interpret this and communicate it. So we would say a dependent means t-test. We'd specifically say what we did when we were reporting this. We didn't just do a t-test. We did a dependent means t-test. And it revealed there was a significant difference. We always, that's what we're talking about. Is there a significant difference or not? That's what that whole T critical is, is about. Is it a significant difference? So it revealed a significant difference between the duration participants tolerated being tickled by the experimenter compared to tickling themselves. We specifically say what we're looking for, what we're looking at, and what we're comparing it to. And then this is how we report it. T, with the degrees of freedom in brackets, equaled 3.04. Okay, which is a P of less than 0.05. That was the cutoff we looked at, the alpha, with a D of 1.24. So if I see that, that tells me everything I need to know to interpret that experiment you did. All right, this is how you looked at it. This is the test you did. This is how it came out, and it's a pretty big effect size. So this is how you need to report this kind of stuff. And it's really important that you report these things correctly. So, for a single sample Z test, we have a sample and we know about the population. We know the mean and the variance of the population. We compute the standard error of the sampling distribution. Uh, and then we use the Z tables to determine the critical values of Z. If we've got an alpha of 0.05, that's 1.96. All right? And then we just evaluate our observed Z and compare it to the critical values. 
For a single sample t-test, we've got one sample and we know the population mean, but not the population variance. Okay, so we have to estimate the population variance based on the sample, then we use that to estimate the standard error of the sampling distribution, then we can determine a, um, a, a, a t-value uh, and we determine the critical values and we compare our um, t against the critical values. But it's a different t, a critical cutoff, depending on our sample size. Then for a dependent means t-test, we want to compute the different scores in each, uh, in each of the repeated conditions for each participant. Okay, so for each participant, we get the different score. We then estimate the variance of the population of different scores. We know that the mean of the different scores should be zero under the null hypothesis. We estimate the standard error of the sampling distribution. We use the t-tables to determine our critical cutoff, depending on our sample size. Then we compute the observed t and evaluate it against the critical value, taking into account the degrees of freedom associated with sample size. So we've got a z-test, single sample t-test, and a dependent means t-test, which is essentially a single sample t-test as well. We turn it into a single sample t-test. These are the formulae. This is how we estimate the population parameter. This is how we then estimate the, um, the, the, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And this is just our t-score for our sample. And we'll compare that to the critical cutoff value. And if you want to know all about this, it's, uh, it's all in Chapter 7 of the textbook. And um, but don't forget to thank William Gossett and Guinness Beer uh, for uh, being able to do this. Next week, we'll do the independent means. Um, so we'll see what we do if we've got two different samples doing, uh, doing a similar sort of thing. But again, it's going to be a very similar kind of process. All right?